Hey everybody, here's a replay on a live workshop I just ran on how to become a sponsored athlete. If you wanna follow along with all the folders I'm going through, then join the link in the description here, and then you can follow along perfectly on everything. Also, if you're in that group folder, you'll get updated on when the next workshop is because I'm gonna run something in the next week here. Anyways, let's jump right into it. Hope you enjoy it. My name is Mark Matthews, a professional mountain biker who's been living my passion full time for the last six years. If you work hard enough, you can create this life for yourself. Thanks guys for joining. Thank you everyone. Welcome to How to Become a Sponsored Athlete. My name is Mark Matthews. I'm a professional mountain biker. I've been a sponsored athlete for over 10 years now, and I've been doing this professionally for about seven. And I started off as a free ride mountain biker. I still am, I guess, technically. So I grew up from like the early thousands watching the old New World Disorder movies and just being inspired by guys going off like big drops and jumps, like guys like Bender and those dudes. And that's kind of what I love to do. I just love riding my bike, doing crazy stuff, um, trying to learn tricks. I wasn't interested in racing ever. I did a few races growing up, but I didn't really have a ton of interest in that. I wanted to really just like learn tricks and more stuff. And then slope style kind of emerged. I competed in slope style from 2008 to 12-ish, those that four-year window. Did Red Bull Rampage one year, got pretty injured there, and then just kind of shifted my focus to not really doing contests anymore, but working on building up media, um, doing unique video projects with my current sponsors, and trying to make myself more marketable to brands and how to become, I guess, a professional at this who could do it full-time as a living without having to like chase the contest circuit, the races, all that sort of stuff. So this workshop basically encompasses all the things I've learned over the last 10 years more than anything else. And I've put it all into one folder for you here where you can see all the little things you need to know about, um, yeah, how to do this professionally. So the number one first thing, if we're gonna go over to, I'm just gonna hide this here. Um, we're on the screen now. So I'll just, um, let me just double check here before we jump right in. So I wanna confirm with you guys, if someone can, can answer with me here in the chat, the only thing you should be able to see is uh, my bubble up screen, is that correct? So, yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, so we'll jump right into the very first folder here and that's on discover your talent. So when I talk about discovering your talent, I mean, it seems really straightforward, but a lot of people, and I've had a lot of questions about this, are really confused about what they should focus on when they first start uh, riding or doing their sport, whatever it is they're on, they don't know where to focus. Like, am I gonna become a racer? Am I gonna become a slope style athlete? Am I just gonna film myself and do fun stuff all the time and hopefully build a big following on social media? Like, what is my focus? Am I gonna do it all? So it is important to choose a career path and decide what exactly you're gonna do in the long term. But yeah, don't be in a rush to figure it out though. I think just trying to sample everything, having as much fun as possible. Like for me, I never really knew what I was doing. And it just kind of like naturally turned into mountain biking for fun and then making it marketable to brands because like I was never a really good contest rider. Like my best result I think is like fifth place in a slope style contest, which was like the run of my life. I never <laughs> came close to winning that one, even though I was really stoked with my run. So yeah, like don't put too much pressure on yourself to compete unless that's what you really want to be doing and you're already like decided on that. Um, but keep riding as fun as possible. Experiment with different riding styles. So try some races, try going to some different events, work on dirt jump tricks, whatever it is you're working on. Um, um, so yeah, you want to hold I am, I'm 32 now. So I first started really getting support doing this in my early 20s. And until then, it was honestly a struggle. So it it takes a long time. You definitely have to be patient. So a few recommendations here in the in the slide. So enter races, connect with filmmakers. I want you to give yourself a solid, well-rounded base when you're first starting out. And when I'm talking about building connections, like if you can find someone who can film you ride your bike or whatever it is you're doing, and, and document what you're doing, and you can post about it, like that's going to be awesome. Like that's going to really help you more than anything else when you're starting out. If if you can have a friend. If, they, if they're not interested in riding what you're riding, but they just want to like film you for fun, get them to film you and 
post about it and like document it. And it's kind of nice motivation too, because you can watch yourself riding and you can work on improving it if you don't have a friend to push you. So you're 30 in the next month and you just start riding three years ago. Um, I don't think you're ever too old. It really depends what you're doing. Like if you're almost 30 and you want to get into like slope style or downhill racing, it might be a bit of a stretch because everyone you'd be competing against is quite a bit younger. But if you even look at someone like Aaron Gwynn, like he's in his 30s and he started later and he was still able to become like the fastest guy in the world. So it really depends on like where you're putting all your energy into. But I think about the same thing too now that I'm in my 30s. Like I'm not trying to learn new tricks all the time now. I'm just trying to like stay dialed on my bike and put out nice content all the time. And I definitely look at risk a little differently now. Okay, so that's just a photo. So I'm gonna jump to the next one here. So this is in our document you guys can check out. I'm not gonna have time to go into every single thing I put in here. I'm just gonna go over the basics in the next hour here, but seven secrets athletes can teach you about being the best at anything. It's pretty cool. It's, it's just like from a high performance perspective more than anything, but it's a lot to do with mindset and like not letting people discourage you and all that sort of stuff. So I'd really recommend diving into that article after this and taking a look at it. Okay, so I'm just gonna answer a couple more questions here before I jump into skill building and training. Um, okay, so having friends with sponsors, that definitely helps a little bit in terms of building connections and pushing yourself with riding. So I'm gonna jump into that too. Um, I can ride blacks and my skills are okay. Risk is a big thing with work, yes. Um, racing is definitely hard. I would say like, you just really have to work on focusing on what exactly you want to do. And if you're not going to be racing, then how much of your energy are you going to be putting into the other stuff? And I'm going to jump more into this. So a lot of your questions are going to be answered here. So I'm, before we slow things down too much, I'm just going to be jumping straight into skill building and training. So one example I used was Brandon Sumanak. I've known Brandon since we were like 14 years old and I've always been inspired by his riding and his work ethic. And I thought this popular mechanics interview was really good. He just kind of talked about how much he actually rode and practiced. And then this other link I have here called Rebuilt, that's a video I did with XS after I injured myself. And I kind of talked about my mindset with recovery. So recovering from injury really well is a huge part of training and building your skill. So I definitely recommend checking out those two links. But I'm going to get into this boulder right here for you guys this is a quick thing i threw together on all the things you need to know about progression and getting better on on your bike because this is a huge piece of it so skill building and some and training so patience is key you need to have so much of it for me like that's kind of where i got really lucky i was naturally born quite patient and i honestly don't think i had a lot of <laughs> natural talent compared to a lot of my friends who never pursued a professional career. And I think it's because I was patient. Some tricks, for example, like the tail whip, that took me almost a year to learn, right? Friends who learned it in a week, but I just, I was relentless and didn't want to give up with it. And you just have to like always be trying stuff. So just to give you a sense of timeline on how long it actually takes to learn things, I'm going to use the dirt jump trick as an example of how long it takes to learn something. If training while injured, just gonna, okay, I'm just gonna answer that quickly. Um, in terms of like training while injured, like I would say like keep yourself fit, but keep yourself off the bike till you're 100%. So go road biking, do your physio, stay on top of physio, do some yoga, do like healthy eating, all that stuff that's really gonna help you boost your recovery as quick as possible. Focus on recovering as quick as you can and not trying to ride when you're hurt. Okay, so this is what it takes to learn a 360 tilt. And this is for someone like me who doesn't learn really fast, but has a lot of patience and was able to learn this. So first you have to learn how to feel comfortable pumping and flowing over rollers and tabletop jumps. And this can take a while just to feel comfortable in that body position in that bike. Keep in mind, I'm taking this from a complete beginner's perspective. The next thing you wanna learn how to jump, feel good in the air. This could take a few months. Then you start hitting gap jumps. You'll probably be hitting these sort of jumps for like a year or two before you're really comfortable throwing bigger tricks and then perfecting bigger gap jumps that give you enough air to throw big tricks. 
there is a lot of like scary aspects of getting to this level and that does take a lot of time too like this could take you years so let's just say we've been learning pretty quick and we're at two years now and now we're ready to learn 360s and tail ups both of these tricks can take at least a year to dial in so let's say we're at three years now and we can do a 360 and a tail up and now we want to learn a 360 tail up this is a very technical trick you need to perfect your timing and weight shifting right off the jump you need a lot of time on the bike your air awareness won't be learned quickly overnight like it's going to take forever so you really need to think about okay i need the patience i really need to practice this over and over until i get it to give you guys an example i started trying 360 tail whips in 2010 and they're still not consistent now and i haven't consistently landed them on dirt in a few years so it's a really tough trick to do and a lot of stuff is like this so you need patience the second thing is i want you to set aside time for practice if you want to get to that level of being a professional athlete you need to put in the hours like you have to treat it like a full-time job and when i mentioned brandon semnek when i first opened this boulder i thought of him right away because like he was so inspiring to me at a younger age i remember like living in whistler and it was like seven in the morning and i get a text being like hey i'm going to the dirt jumps and then he'd be there riding by himself for like three hours when no one else would want to get out of bed so having that work ethic is going to be huge you need to set aside that time for practice I wrote in a rough number. I said 30 plus hours a week is what you need to get professional. I don't know exactly, but definitely a few hours a day and focus on a specific skill when you go ride. It's, and it's not just all about fun. Unfortunately, like you have to treat it like a job. Your talent will be a factor, but your work ethic, your work ethic is what's gonna separate you and make you a professional rider. Takes a lot of sacrifices. I'll give you an example. In 2010, I moved to North Vancouver and I was like definitely struggling to pay rent and everything. So I had a job working at night where I'd work from like 4 p.m. till midnight. And that would give me enough money to just like get by and ride my bike all day during the day. So I could literally just ride all day, sleep, and then work. Nothing else. I had time for nothing else. Like didn't even really party or hang out with friends too much. Like I was just working, riding, working, riding. Same thing in the summertime, I ended up with a landscaping job where I think I went through five jobs in one summer because I would leave for a week to go to an event. <laughs> and then I would come back and they would fire me or I would just, they'd be like, well, we need you this week. Like we have a busy week. I'm like, well, I need to go to this event. So I'm going. And I think that is kind of what I took that risk. And I kind of got to the point where even living in a city as big as Vancouver, I ran out of companies to work for. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a risk, but you have to like really put your all into, into the riding and you have to do that. And I, when someone just asked, what's the most intelligent way of training? Should I be trying different tricks on a different day or stick with one skill? I mean, whatever is most fun as, and it's gonna keep you motivated. As soon as you leave your, as soon as you lose that motivation, you're not gonna be learning skills anymore. Um, you really need to stay motivated and that's gonna be, what does it for you? So for me, like there's a lot of tricks I didn't learn because I just wasn't motivated. I'd rather like try to ride a section of trail fast or work on something stylish. And my riding kind of developed into that style because I didn't have a lot of fun practicing the same tricks over and over again. So yeah, I'd say the best way of training is focus on what you have the most fun doing and just like hammer that out as much as you can. Another great way to build your skills is ride with friends. You need to find equally motivated people. This can be really hard. But if you can ride with people who want to get better than you or are better than you, that's going to be huge. So on our example, when I was 21, I moved to North Vancouver to live with my friends, Eric Lornuck and Jordy Lunn. So Jordy was a professional mountain biker and like someone I really idolized. My friend Eric had sponsors and was getting paid a bit of money to ride his bike. So living in this environment really helped my riding. We were roommates. We rode bikes together every day. After work, I would try to join them for a ride and I would just like, learn off them and like so much cool stuff happened like I just learned so much from those guys and we would film each other ride our bikes together and we would have more content that way and it was just like it's just a win-win from all angles so riding as friends and find people better than you don't be embarrassed to ride with people better than you just soak up from them try to learn from them and try to like see what they're doing and like help them push you the next thing is have a specific location for practice it's not as easy as just going out to the trails and riding every day. You really need to like put in that extra effort to work on 
like where you're going to practice. So for me, I would always go around trying to build dirt jumps in random little neighborhoods around my parents' house when I was a kid. And so many of these spots got torn down. And then luckily this one time, someone let us use their private property after they found out we were digging in there. And we ended up having a jump spot for a couple of years. And we got super lucky with that. It gave us a spot to go because jump parks didn't really exist 15 years ago like they do now. Like it was really rare. So it was a lot harder then. But if you can have a spot to practice. So for example, if you're a downhill racer, go build a technical set of turns and just like rally them over and over or choose a section of a trail and time yourself hitting it over and over and try to beat your time every time. I have a lot of friends who do some World Cups now and when they were younger, that's what they would do. It, even if it was just like a little hiking trail up the road from where they lived, they would find a section of it and just like hit it over and over and they would try to ride it faster. And then minimizing your risk. So if you can find, like say you're a slope style rider and you wanna learn tricks, you need a foam pit or an airbag and most people don't have this. So even something like a step up jump, a soft landing on a jump, anything that's gonna lower the risk and minimize the consequence is gonna be huge for you. You need to do that. And I think like I said in this document that Nitro Circus is the perfect example of this because if you look at the way they run things, they're doing like world's first tricks, they're doing huge jumps, but they're doing it onto like resi ramps with like foam and a soft layer of plastic on top of the landings. So even if they crash on these huge tricks, they're not gonna be like as hurt as they would on a big regular jump. So they're using this technique, they're minimizing risk. So think about that when you're even building a spot for yourself or you're going somewhere to ride to practice, find somewhere that's lower risk, it's great for practicing and it's not maybe the funnest thing to ride, but it's gonna really help you build your skill. Another thing is staying healthy, nutrition is really important. It's definitely harder when you don't have a lot of money to spend on food. I know this for sure, but if you can like be smarter with your meal planning and think about it, like the analogy I used here is you wouldn't put regular gas in a race car. So if you're gonna be a top performing athlete, you need to have top performing fuel. So for me, I supplement with vegan greens and proteins every day. I eat a lot of organic fruits and veggies, drink a lot of water, more water than you think, and have a diet heavy on like antioxidants and omegas and all that good stuff. Um, limit sugar and alcohol. Both these things will slow down your healing and your performance. And then a workout routine, if you have that, if you want to place that in like to your schedule, like I work out a few days a week on top of everything, but I'd say more than anything, a quick yoga or stretching routine at home every day will make a huge difference with in terms of like how your body recovers from stuff. And I honestly think like keeping yourself dialed really helps with muscle memory and everything else. So that's a big part of it, health and nutrition and then time management. Like if you look at this whole list here, this is crazy. There's so much to do like, wait, so I got to ride 30 hours a week. It's going to take me years to learn something. I need to build a spot. I need to find friends to ride with. I need to eat healthy. I need to stretch. Um, and on top of that, I have to do all, all this content. How am I going to find time for this? And time management is such a big skill. I actually use bubble up to help me with time management in terms of like organizing folders and putting content into, into different places. I'm gonna mention that at the very end of the workshop, how I utilize Bubble Up to save my time. But here's a few things that are just general pointers for managing your time. First thing is only touch something once. So if you're gonna do something, only do it once that day. What I mean is never come back to something you've started. So whether it's trying to learn a trick, practice it over and over for like an hour and then move on to something else, don't go back to it. And that's going to save you time because you're not going to waste like all this time going back on something that you can't figure out right away. Same with like anything, like say you have to do some schoolwork before you are able to go biking, like do that first. If it's most important, don't do it multiple times a day because you're going to be procrastinating. You don't want to procrastinate ever. So only touch things once, make a list of the six most important things you want to accomplish that day. And then just like check them off with the most important thing at the very top least important thing at the bottom and assign a time that it's going to take you to do each thing. So if you're like, okay, I'm going to practice riding this section of trail today for two hours. And that's the most important thing for me today. So I'm going to do that first thing in the morning. Okay. Second thing is I got to finish this like school project or whatever else it is. Then I have to go to work and then like throw that all in to the order most um, important to least important. If you feel overwhelmed, then scan through and ask yourself, will it hurt me to throw that one thing away? Maybe it's not as important as I thought now that I have it all written out. 
And that's just a little strategy I use for myself to manage my time. And it's, it's pretty crazy. You realize how much time you actually waste just like scrolling through Instagram or talking to friends or going on YouTube. There's like so much time we waste doing pointless stuff. And if you can cut that out of your life and you need to, like you have to cut out any time wasting activity from your life if you're going to be a professional athlete. So that's the whole skill building and training section. We're already at almost 1230 and I'm only at the second part. So I'm going to try to speed this up a bit. There's a ton of content here. The next thing is network as an ambassador. And when everyone asks, what's the best way to get a sponsor to notice you? Networking is huge. So let's look at some of the points around networking. You want to attend events, create relationships and real friends and build rapport with people you regularly cross paths with. So let's say you go to like a downhill race. Say you're doing like a good example of one is the BC Cup circuit and here in British Columbia, it's a set of downhill races throughout the summer. Let's say you go to five races and you notice like at one of the bike brands booths, the same person's working there every race. Go up to them and do something nice for them. Like think about what you can do for them, not what they can do for you. This is a potential sponsor. So you want to like become friends with them and it's all about like building that relationship. So like ask about the bikes, show them your bike, um, tell them what, like, about your racing, ask them about themselves, like try to find out more about the events they go to and just like learn more about the industry and then do nice things for people. Like if you have photos of yourself riding that you think are cool, like offer to give them to that person so they can post it or they can just have more content because companies always love more content and it doesn't matter if you're an athlete for them or not. Like, if you just start sending content to athletes, like if it's a photo or a video of you riding, be like, hey, like if you want to post this, like you can have this. Like they're gonna really appreciate that because it's more material for them and they'll always be thinking about you. And I think that's a big part of networking is don't let people leave your mind. Like always have them on your mind. Don't worry about bugging them as long as you have something valuable to give them, they'll always be appreciative. And with that, you on the next point, you want to create something unique that draws people to you on or off the bike. So whether that is like the photos you post or like the, your personality, um, that's going to be a huge part of it. Like there's a lot of people out there with unique personality and that's something that this article here, let me just get this tab out of my way. That's something this article right here talks about on pink bike. So you want to be sponsored. I'd really recommend looking at that. He talks about how someone like Kelly McGarry can really stand out because of their unique look and their, their hair and just like their presence. So having that personality is gonna be a great way to network with people. It's a huge part of it. And finally, don't worry about people judging you. Like don't worry about friends making fun of you because you post the same stuff over and over or you're constantly posting like something semi -pro like promotional or like you're not quite sure, like maybe you're not confident because you know you're not good enough to be a pro rider so you don't wanna post your riding videos because they might not seem that impressive to other people. Never be embarrassed about this. Like just always try to document and don't worry about like creating too much stuff. You always want to be out there documenting stuff and having fun and showing it to people. Don't worry about anyone judging you. Like that's really going to hold you back. And honestly, like people will see this confidence in you and they'll look up to you because they'll be able to sense it. The next part of networking as an ambassador is just becoming a great ambassador in general. So once you become a sponsored athlete, you really want to know, like you really have to understand that you are now a spokesperson for that brand. You're representing that company and they're trusting the things you do and say. So for example, if you're like at a bike park and you're around a group of people, you want to like, if you're with your friends, like just be careful of the conversations you're ha having if there's kids around, rather than like talking with your friends and trying to be cool and like show off your tricks, like go talk to those kids and encourage them and like, tell them they look awesome on their bike and like do all this stuff that would make them like your sponsor proud of you. It's not just about your riding. It's about like how you carry yourself and how you're perceived to the public eye. That's a huge part of it. And again, this goes hand in hand with the personality part I just talked about. Like it's really important to be like a very approachable person, give people your time. You want to spark up conversations too. So for those of you who are extroverted extroverted versus introverted, it's a lot easier. For me, I'm pretty introverted. So when I was younger, I was, I was really shy and this was really hard for me. But if you can like always be friendly to people, educate them on the products you're endorsing and do all this sort of stuff, like that is really great. 
And just remember, you're always focusing on more than yourself. You want to bring value to your fans. So for example, like me using bubble up here as this platform is a perfect example because I'm doing a workshop. I'm teaching you guys how to be sponsored. I'm not just like showing off my skills. I'm trying to, yeah, I'll just throw it in here. My, here's my Instagram. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll get to these questions later, <laughs> but yeah, it's, that's my handle there. So I think like having that too, like giving people lots of great stuff. I have this as an example too, mtbcourse.com. I'm going to be doing online courses soon for mountain bikers and I'll be posting stuff here on bubble up as well. So that's just an example of like all the great things you can do that is bringing value to your audience. It's not just about learning cool stuff on a bike. You want to think about like what you're doing for the sponsors, what you're doing for the people and you're basically a service to everyone. And that's something you have to think about. That's what makes you a great ambassador. Okay, the next thing which I get a lot of questions about is social media. Yeah, when I see the question, same goes, same goes from motocross, like 100%. Like, I think there's a lot of crossover between the moto world and mountain biking. Very similar culture. Events are very similar. And uh, yeah, I, this is really like quite universal. I would say this is applicable to many sports. <clears throat> okay, social media. So I have a few examples of like guys who are, are absolutely killing it like Fabio and Matt Jones and these guys go check out their YouTube channels after this workshop because they just kill it and their content is so, so good. Um, another thing to watch is this is someone I look up to Gary V. He's like a businessman. He does a lot of stuff on social media strategy and just like his outlook and what he does to really build up his channels is really, really smart. And it's definitely helped me a lot personally. So I'd really recommend checking out this quick video at the end of this workshop. But here's a few of my personal notes. So when you're not riding, you should be creating content for social media. Don't put too much pressure on yourself to make perfect posts. Don't worry about others judging you, like I said already. Just put lots of content out there. Capture your passions, this will shine through. So if you're posting a few times a day and talking about what you're passionate about, talking about your struggle, become relatable to people because that's a huge part of it too. It's not just about being like the sickest rider out there. You want to relate to your audience. So if you're like, hey, I'm only 18 years old. I'm trying to be a sponsored athlete. Here's all the struggles I'm going through. Like if you make yourself vulnerable and you talk about that in a caption and then post like, all your, like a roll of your favorite photos from like that month, like people are going to love those sort of posts. I think that sort of stuff is really cool because people can relate to it and they want to follow your journey and they want to like follow your story almost and see how you progress. It's a one way to make people more interested in you more interested in you than they would be if you were if you were just like not quite at that level yet and you were just posting like regular stuff so it's just one way to put a different spin on things there's a few more points on social media engage with your audience so be social it's social media so you need to engage with people respond to comments leave messages leave comments and messages um create content that will start conversation so i always love to like throw questions in my captions and be like hey what's your like, for example, the other day, I just posted a photo of me on my Hawk Hill because I absolutely love that bike. And I was like, hey, this is like, if you could have one bike for anything, what would it be? And then I got a lot of answers. People tell me what their bikes were. And that created more comments, which made the post more popular. So things that are going to engage people and start a conversation is, is really good. And it doesn't really matter if you like social media or not. It's basically the current state of the internet. You have to be a part of it. I know so many riders who push back on it still. They're really well established pro athletes and it's definitely hurting their career now as, as especially as they get older and they're not at the top of their game anymore. If they're not on top of their social media game, then they just don't bring as much value to the brands that they've sponsored, even if they're legends in the sport. So you really have to think about that and you have to realize that it is very important whether or not you like it. It should be a hundred percent your focus almost and mandatory if you're a media athlete. Like, yes, you want to have your own unique content. You want to be putting stuff out there for sponsors on their channels too, but your own personal social media is extremely important if you're a media athlete, like this is a mandatory thing. So to successfully build your brand in 2020, you need to be on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook. All of these are important. Instagram's the big one. It's, gonna, it's not going to go away, so make sure you're always on there every day posting. TikTok is kind of the new one, younger audience, but its organic growth is insane, and it's a huge opportunity for you to get on there, post something every day, gain a bit of a following, and bring them over to other platforms. 
And may, who knows, maybe one day it will become the next Instagram. We, we don't really know at this point. So just being open to trying out new platforms like that is really great. And it's something you need to put your energy into. YouTube, obviously a really good one. YouTube's never going away. <laughs> and uh, yeah, see, so Charles said he found me on TikTok, which is funny. I've had a lot of people tell me that lately. And it's, it's funny because like, I didn't even think about it until a few months ago. It was never on my mind. And now I just love to post on there. YouTube is another one, never going away. It's always going to stay. And I feel like unlike Instagram, the organic engagement hasn't really dropped off because it's not kind of structured that way. So it's, it's great to do YouTube if you love being on video. If you're not like comfortable on video, one really cool opportunity would be to like create your own podcast if you like talking or interviewing people. Like if it's about like trying to talk to other riders <laughs> that you look up to and trying to interview them, like to help your own riding career, like that could be a way to build up your personal brand if you're more introverted and you don't like being on video. That's an option too. And Facebook, we all kind of forget about Facebook because it's an older demographic, but it's huge and it's not going away. Facebook pretty much owns everything. <laughs> so you should have a Facebook athlete page at the very least and try to share stuff from Instagram on there just so you have like something happening on there. So I'd say Facebook is still important. And a lot of guys like Fabio Widmer, Matt Jones, all those dudes, they're all paying photographers and filmmakers to create content for them so they can have like amazing YouTube channels. And I'm not like quite comfortable to get to this point yet where I can have someone full time do that for me. But if you can get to that level, like your life just gets way easier. So it's kind of like the very start of all this is the very hardest. And if you can really figure out things as you go along with it and not worry about doing anything perfect, just keep working hard on your writing, on your content, all of it. That's all going to eventually pay off and it will help you get to that professional level at everything you're doing. The next one here is acquiring sponsorships. Now, this is like such a hard one to teach people because it's so based on the individual person. Like if you're a racer, acquiring a sponsorship is going to be extremely different than someone who's a media athlete or a like soap style athlete. There's just a whole different kind of strategy around that. So I'm just going to show with you the athlete resume that I made for a Eurobike last year to give to sponsors. And this is kind of what I used as like a quick introduction to myself. What I did was I, so my strategy was I knew I was going to Eurobike. So I emailed companies, introduced myself in like a couple sentences, said I was going to be at Eurobike, put a link to my social media channels in the email and said, Hey, like if you have five, if I could get five minutes of your time, at the trade show, I'm, I'm going to be there with a schedule and a time. And I got lots of meetings. I brought my iPad with me and I just kind of scrolled through this and showed it to them. And if, then I emailed the materials later. So here's my athlete profile from last year that I made for this year. My number one focus was on my social media because that's honestly my largest asset to a brand. So think about that. The first thing on your resume should be the largest asset to your brand. Notice how I haven't wrote anything about myself on here. I haven't even introduced myself because I've already done that in an email. I've just, I'm going straight to my most valuable asset, which is my social media accounts. I talk about at this point, so I'm more than this now. I had nearly 300,000 fans in total. Um, I talked about like what, what my strategy was, kind of my outlook on it and why I've grown and how I show like authentic stories of adventure to showcase my creativeness and how it really resonates well with people and they like to follow like they just like to feel like they're along for the ride and that's very powerful for a sponsor because they're like cool like if they're that interested in this person they're gonna like they're gonna trust this person more on the products they're endorsing than just a random ad that they see online because when you get when you follow somebody and you like their content you become a little emotionally invested in them and you become way I guess way more marketable to an athlete, to a brand than just like a random magazine or something, right? And so you gotta think about that. What, what is it about you that makes people draw to you? And if you can show that in a resume, that's huge. Then I talk about my powerful community building. So I've had some viral content on, okay, so if someone asked, please repeat how you would approach a brand. Now I'm gonna be, we're gonna upload this video again so you can see it. But the number one way I would approach a brand out of nowhere, like if I had zero connection at all, is maybe a quick email introduction and try to set up an in-person meeting if I knew there was an opportunity for that. So say I'm gonna be at an event or something like that, I would definitely try to do that. 
if that's not possible and I can't just like even make that work, I would try to meet people in person. First of all, put yourself in a situation where you can meet someone, whether they're a rep or a bike mechanic for a company, anyone who can start a connection for you is the best way to approach a brand. So uh, another thing I showed was my viral content because that's also very valuable to people and how I have a powerful community building. So I'm going into it and I'm showing like kind of my best performing content from last year, over a million views, almost a million views, tons of likes, all this sort of stuff companies love to see. And then talking about how I generally care about fans and want to help them. So like right now I'm trying to help you guys get sponsorships. Um, yes, that's actually a really good idea. Um, I'll throw in an example email in this folder so you can see that as well, just kind of like how I introduce myself. So I genuinely care about everyone in this workshop right now. For example, I want to help you guys. It's like, if you can make a career out of doing what you love, why not? And if I can help someone do that, why not? So I want to be able to show that in a resume so a company can see that like, I'm authentic and that's what I want to do. So I showed Bob Love as, a, as an example here even, like how I have a community of true fans, like people who are interested enough in me to actually sign up for Bob Love, go into a folder and learn about what I'm trying to teach you. And at this time, I didn't have a sponsorship tutorial, but I was doing how I do my YouTube content and my GoPro stuff. So I talked about that in here. The next thing I did was I showed, <laughs> yes, I mean, whoop, blah, blah. <laughs> um, next thing I showed was how I'm able to make sales. Like, how am I physically making sales? Think about this. If you're a sponsored athlete, you're not just like an exceptional performer. You're also selling bikes. You're selling products. The reason they're giving you free bikes and a paycheck is because you're making them more money than they're giving you. That's the whole point of this. So how are you making a company more money than you're giving you? What are some examples of things you're doing well? Marin Bikes personally told me last summer that they had a lot of sales in the United Kingdom linked back directly to me and they knew I had that influence and they were stoked. And then I could like take those figures and use them as an example in the future for other sponsors. So anytime you can show that is awesome. That's what this little quote is. I'm showing how I promoted a tour to Tibet in 2017. This was an expensive tour, like over two grand a person and 11 people signed up through me in just a few months. So that is like the price of a nice mountain bike. And I got 11 people to sign up for a tour. I mean, coming to ride with me is a completely different thing than buying a bike, but it just kind of shows like the powerfulness of my online community and how I'm able to, to leverage that community to make sales and have an influence. And if you're not like a big social media person, but you have get great race results, that's another example of having a good influence because people are so influenced by racers. The next thing I wanted to show was how I helped people offline, not just like my online presence. Yes, like so much of what I do is just online content these days, but I'm still out there in the community. So I do enter local races, downhill and enduro. I never do that well. Like I'll literally get top 10 in the pro categories for like local races, but I'm not like a seasoned racer. I don't have the technique. It's not just about being fast, it's about having that technique. But I do like to show like how I'm always out there. I'm attending races. I'm going to Crankworx every year because like I lived in Whistler for a few years and I just like, I love Crankworx. It's so much fun. I literally get invited to the whip off. I haven't gone in a couple of years, but I try to go when I can. So with the air downhill race, deep summer photo challenge, because I just love working with photographers and, and filmmakers. And I've been invited to a handful of the photo challenges. So that's really cool because that gets shown on a big stage over Crankworx and the village gets lots of eyes on it. It's a valuable thing for sponsors. So I'm just outlining all the things I do when I'm not online that are valuable to my sponsors. I help with my local riding scene. So I talk about how I'm always out there building, giving back to the community or building my own features specifically for video parts. That's a huge part of it. I spend a lot of time working on digging and creating trails. Amy knows this. I took her to my trail when she was here in, in BC. That was pretty cool. But I'm always like going out there and building new trails and trying to create something to document and having that. And the cool thing is like you can build a trail and it can give you content for the next few years because you can just keep posting yourself riding there. And, and that's a huge part of it too. Another example of giving back to your community is when I was younger, like 14 years old, I didn't even have a place to ride. I didn't have a place to practice or train. So I went out there. I wrote a letter to the city council. I went to meetings for a couple of years, like after school. 
and I managed to make this park happen between me and a few friends. And now it's like a legit public bike park. So that was a huge thing I'm pretty proud of. And I made that happen and I gave back to the riding community and I helped my own riding. So anytime I can do that, like that's huge. And sponsors love to see that stuff because it just goes to show how much of an influence you are off the bike, not just on the bike. And I think that's a big thing. Just gonna answer this one question here quickly. So what is the difference between a media athlete and a racer like for sponsors? I would say it's, they're both very difficult in their own way. So if you're a racer, you should be focusing on your race results and training and being as fast as you possibly can. And then social media almost needs to come second. If you're a media athlete, it's flipped the other way around. Like your riding is important, but your media is the most important thing. So for example, like learning how to edit a YouTube video well is just as important as learning a new trick when you're a media athlete versus when you're a, a racer, like learning how to ride as fast as you can is the most important thing. Okay, so the next thing before I get into all these questions is, um, so the next thing I showed was how I went to all these places, Turkey, Iceland, Israel, and I kind of helped give back to their communities. So I'm talking about like giving back to the community. I really go into it here. And then the last thing I added was my commitment to the brands I work with. So what else am I giving the brand? This isn't about me. If you've noticed, this whole resume has nothing to do with how awesome I am. It's all about what am I giving that company? You have to tell them what you're giving them. So regular product feedback, this is very valuable. And this is one of the reasons so much money goes into racing with the biking industry is because when you're downhill racing or enduro racing, you're hammering those bike parts. You're really putting them to their test and companies can take how those parts performed at a race and they can take that data to help them develop their products. So if you're not a racer, you're not giving them that value and you need to be able to think about how you can do that. So I like to go out there. I like to try and early stuff. And I'll give my sponsors like regular monthly feedback on like how something performed, what I liked, what I didn't like. Never be afraid to tell brands what you don't like about their stuff. They actually like really like that. Um, and some other things. So I wrote details. So I just talked about how I'm like 100% committed to the brand I work with. Um, I'll use all their products, of course. I'll be available for photo shoots, media events, any sort of events. I'll display their logo proudly wherever I can. Um, and I'll give them like unrestricted rights to my name and likeness and any of their content so they know what they're getting in this deal. And then just like tying that back to my passion for the sport. So I just kind of wrapped up my resume with how I've been in the sport forever. That's me at like 12 years old right there. Pretty funny. But like just showing how long I've been riding a bike for, how it, I'm like passionate about it. And I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'm just going to answer these quick questions because that is my resume that I kind of sent out to people quickly. Um, I was thinking of creating a list with possible brands and sending them in an email with my photos and videos. You think that's the right way to do it? Um, I honestly think if you can do this as clean as possible. So it's just put yourself in the shoes of the company. If you were receiving an email from a random person who you'd never heard of before, do you think you would really read all those links and go through all that stuff? Probably not. So if you can make the email as short as possible and even have a link to like your social media or an article you're most proud of, and then introduce yourself. And if they come back to you showing interest, that's when you can send over more stuff to them. But that first initial message should be very short and concise and keep it like really basic and just try to like have one or two things in there that's gonna catch the interest of that person. Okay, the next thing is communicating your value and, and how you work. So this is gonna take me a while to go through. We only have 10 minutes left of the actual workshop. So I'm going to just kind of scan through this quickly, but this is kind of an extension of the rider resume. I talk about how I have relationships with advertising agencies who have given me more um, promotion or more exposure, for example. So there's two agencies I work with regularly right now. There's hashtag paid, which is a Canadian based agency. And then there's Vayner Media, which is a New York city based agency. I've both worked with them in the past to get different jobs and showing sponsors that I'm doing this and I'm going outside of the bike industry just shows that I'm trying to get more into the mainstream market and I'm trying to show about um, how I'm like expanding my horizons and kind of opening my mind to like get into different areas because so many riders get stuck in the bike industry. They get frustrated that the bike industry doesn't have enough money, but there's like, if you can just build an audience and you can do cool, unique stuff, there's so much more out there for you. And I kind of talked about this here um 
how I create content and I try to be creative and all the things I do to bring value to a sponsor. So I definitely go out of my way. I've even like been out a few thousand dollars on trips just to create content for a sponsor because I knew the next year it would make me more valuable. And I took that sacrifice and I, I got to the point where like I had to have a job to ride my bike and then I didn't have to have a job, but I could barely afford rent. But then I would find a second job so I could pay for trips myself to create content to all of a sudden make me seem like I was more sponsored than I really was. And I think that it's, you kind of almost have to do that. You have to work really hard. You have to make stuff happen on your own before you can expect a company to do it for you. And I talked about this, like how I create a lot of content on my own by like working at the agencies versus taking from sponsor money. And I kind of, or like this Turkey trip I did, I organized that whole thing on my own. I personally paid the photographer. I managed to get a partner to pay for our flights. And I made that trip happen. And I got a lot of cool stuff that cost my sponsors nothing. Same with Indonesia here. When I went to Bali in 2016, I partnered with an airline and a local, a local um, retreat to make all this rad stuff happen. We came with multiple coverage. It cost the sponsors $0. There's the Turkey example again. I went into detail on how I got a couple magazine covers out of it. And then same thing with Tibet, magazine coverage. I just talked about like how I go out of my way to do all this awesome stuff to help sponsors look good. And they're not organizing this for me. They're not like telling me to do this. I'm doing this all on my own. Um, someone keeps, sorry, yeah, Devin, you're saying, what about a bicycle mechanic? Well, luckily for you, if you're a bike mechanic, that means you're already pretty immersed in the industry. You're in a bike shop. So I'm guessing that you come across bicycle reps all the time. For example, if you work in a shop that, shell, that sells Shimano on their bikes, you've probably met the local Shimano rep a few times. So become friends with that person, tell them like how you want to become sponsored or mention like how you're racing and what you're doing and you'd appreciate some support. And maybe you can work out like a bro deal with the rep that will kind of start to get you in with that brand. And I think being a bike mechanic and working at a bike shop is a really great way to get connected in the industry. It's awesome. And yeah, someone's uh, Austin, you're saying, should the first sponsor be local bike shops? Absolutely. Like that was my very first sponsor was a local bike shop. And it's because I got to build that connection. I got to start meeting reps and you start, as soon as you start to build sponsors at a grassroots level, you can build up from there. Like, it kind of goes like this, like you, you meet the rep at the bike company who comes into the bike shop, you do stuff for them. If they're really happy with what you're doing, they don't have a lot of power within a brand in terms of sponsorships, but they're able to talk to people because their boss or someone they work for is the marketing manager for that brand as a whole. And if they've been excited about you for a couple of years, the brand might want to meet you and then you go riding with them. They like you and who you are and they're impressed by your riding that's going to be kind of like you're in with that brand. And that's that relationship building is what's going to make it for you. Another example, I've partnered with tourism boards before to pay for trips. So sponsors don't need to, and I've just gotten creative in a few different ways. And whenever I've shown this to sponsors, they're very impressed because they're stoked that I'm able to be this kind of creative and self-sustainable without needing their budgets. And that brings a lot of valuable to them for me. So, there's all that. I talked about my audience analytics, where they're all from. Companies always love to see this sort of stuff. So I threw that in there and that's kind of it. So that is the extension of my resume and I give people a schedule. So Austin, you're saying, should we email and introduce yourself as well as sending lots of photos? I would say maybe attach one photo, do like a quick sentences to intro yourself. And then maybe list off things that make you valuable to them and like what you can provide for them. And then um, like mention like your social channels, have links to them and try to like do a nice intro and outro being like, hey, if you're more interested and you wanna learn more, like I'd love to connect and keep it nice and simple and clean. Another thing too is once you get the conversation rolling with a potential sponsor, you wanna give them a schedule of what you're doing. People love seeing this organization. So this was my tentative schedule for 2020. I think I wrote this back in October. Nothing is the same now, um, especially with all this COVID stuff going on. Basically my entire year has been canceled, but I just put out like a quick list of what I was gonna be doing this year for people to see. If you notice, it's not super detailed and a lot of this stuff was just a maybe, but even if it's something you're maybe doing, throw it in there because it's nice to see that you're actively planning and doing stuff. 
and people love to see that. So those are all the materials you want to be working on to acquire sponsors. So I'm going to get to Sam's question really quick here, and then I'm, we're going to spend the last five minutes or so here talking about how to acquire sponsors or how to work with sponsors you have already. So you are 16 and you just started a sponsorship with Continental, not paid yet, just free stuff. Um, so you want to turn this into a paid contract. Um, do you ask for a paid contract? So this is a tough one. I mean, I honestly didn't have a single paid contract until I was like probably 20, three, 24. It was hard for me, like not being a competitor and having social media not a thing yet because I'm like quite a bit older than you. So social media wasn't really a thing for me. I think to get paid, like you have to prove yourself, like definitely have to prove yourself because for someone to pay you, you need to be making them more money than they're giving you. So what are you doing that's making them more money than, than they're giving you? You have to really think about like, are you, are you doing really well in races? Are you building up a big social media following, what is it that makes you worth a paycheck? And you have to think about that. And if you can have like a really solid sales pitch that you can give them and you can know your worth and own it, then that's gonna really help you. Nice, everyone's showing each other's Instagram, that's cool. Okay, so we only have a few minutes left. I'm gonna jump into working with sponsors and then I'm gonna go a little over time if that's okay. And I'm gonna talk about, I'm just gonna answer everyone's questions for the last extra few minutes here. Okay, working with sponsors. One thing I do, which is really cool, um, it's been the number one thing I've loved Bubble Up for, is I can turn a bunch of content that I save into a folder and I can turn it into what you call a role. And then this role will be like a presentation. So I'll give you an example. Um, I don't have time to go into it now, but this is something I'll do in the future is I'll teach you guys how to create Bubble Up roles to create presentations. But it's honestly one of the cleanest ways you can do it. I'll create a pitch deck. So here's a successful pitch deck. I changed a few little details. I took out the company name and stuff. A few things I did to get a budget approved for actually quite a bit of money for a big project I was hoping to do this year. It might get pushed to next year. But I put in the title and then subtitle, who presented it. I love this theme too. I think this one's called Showcase. It's a really clean theme for pitching. And I mentioned, here's the story of what I'm doing. Here's um, what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna do a video with my friend Scott, then I'm gonna do my own behind the scenes video version. So in my pitch deck, I'm showing the companies right away what exactly the deliverables will be, what I'm giving them, what the story is gonna be of this trip. It was gonna be a trip to Namibia and Africa and still might happen this year, who knows, but we just showed like what we want the story to be about, what the footage is gonna look like, what the content's gonna look like, the themes of focus. So researching the idea of mountain biking in Namibia, um, connecting myself to the landscapes and showing the adventure, showing mountain biking kind of contrasted against nature. And then this was for excess energy. So clearly showing the logo, always show companies that you're gonna promote them and show them off in, their, in the branding that you're doing. Um, it'll be a challenging shoot. So we wanna show like the athletic endurance of it in the desert, like show the intensity of this region we're going to. We really want to kind of bring that out in this project. And we kind of want to look at the environmental aspects of it. It's like, yeah, we're traveling across the world to, to mountain bike, but we're going to be camping the entire time. So we want to lower our carbon footprint and we want to show like how you can do a really rad, crazy adventure at minimal kind of environmental impact. So we had that sort of as kind of focus, themes of focus. And then you always want to show what you're delivering a brand and a pitch. So I outlined the deliverable set, what I'm giving them. And then I showed where it's being distributed. And then in order to break down the budget, I kind of had to show them the filming schedule and what it would cost. So we got quoted by a tour company. I'll give you an example here. They said, this is what we would be doing in our trip. And the tour company was gonna charge us $1,500 a person. So that's $4,500. So say you're asking a brand for way more money than that, then you have to let them know like, this is what this trip is actually costing. And to be honest, like I did get multiple support for this. And I'm gonna be showing so many aspects of it through a few different brands who are supporting it. But there's like so much cost to this that I actually am spending a bit of my own money to make this happen. And sometimes you have to do that. And to, in order to get budget, you almost have to show the sacrifices you're making and people need to understand the value of what you're doing. And then I gave them the timeline and that just kind of was a wrap for it, the breakdown on the budget. And 
I, what I really love about Bubble Up Roles is I can have a link to my social accounts or my website and same with our team. So like it was myself, my friend Scott, and then my other friend Ruben were the team and we have that in there. So it was a really nice way to present it. So creating a pitch deck, we're at one o'clock now, so I can't really go way more into this, but I'll show you one thing you need to look at. I talk about this more. Definitely go check out this LinkedIn article I wrote about media project principles. It really talks into more detail on how to create a really good pitch deck for a sponsor and how to sell them on an idea and how to make something really great. So that's it for all the content. I'm just going to come jump into Q and a for, let's say I'll go over like, let's say like 10 minutes or so here and we can, for anyone who wants to stay on, I will, um, I'll do that. So I'm going to go to a different mode here. I'm just going to share. I'll come off the video share. I'll turn on my video here so you guys can see me. <laughs> this computer's lagging a bit because I still got Adobe Premiere open. So I'm going to turn that on. So yeah, can everyone see me now? Just to get confirmation on the chat. Yeah, we can see you. Uh, okay. Maybe you want to stop your screen share so that you're like full screen. Yeah, so I can stop the share here. Is that got better for you guys? Oh yeah. Perfect, okay, perfect, nice. So yeah, that was all the content in the folder. I definitely ripped through it really fast because it's really hard to squeeze that all into an hour. But any more questions you have right now, just like, I probably missed them in the chat. So make sure to save them again. And um, yeah, I'll try to get back to you. I'll, over the next 10 minutes here, I'll, I'll get over those with you guys. Okay, so Nathan, you're asking, oh, wait, no, Jesse's asking, any tips for a multi-sport athlete, snowboard, skate, and mountain bike? Yeah, well, my, one of my friends, Casey, he's done this really well. Like, I, I honestly don't know how. It's, it's really tough because you have to really put your focus and energy on the one sport you're doing. So if you're a multi-sport athlete, like seasonal sports are great. So if you're a snowboarder and a mountain biker in the winter, like do all the stuff I've been talking about and kind of like put mountain biking aside for the winter, but also be staying on top of things with your sponsors, like stay in communication. I think that's a huge part of it over communicating with your sponsors that you are a multi-sport athlete and that your energy is going into this sport in the one time of the year and vice versa with your other sponsors. Like you just have to always be communicating with them and really staying focused. So when I'm talking about time management, this gets extra difficult with multiple sports and I honestly don't have a lot of experience with it. Um, my biking definitely wouldn't be at the same level it is if I had more than one sport going on. So I think your best strategy is to choose one sport over the other and make the other one more fun. So rather than trying to make two full-time careers out of two sports, have like a um, part-time sponsor sport in one season and then another full-time sponsor in the other season. Okay, um, how big should a resume be? I would say send out a short, quick introductory email. And then from there, kind of gauge the interest of the company and then kind of find out their needs before you send out all this stuff. So if they're a company more interested in racing, don't spend a lot of time talking about the whole social media side of things, like put in your channels and show that value, but maybe have like maybe just one page max resume with a quick introduction and then some race results and then links to your social media. And then maybe links to some articles on things you are, you've been really great at doing that you're proud of. So Adam asked me if I'm a sole proprietor and what stage um, do I do that? What measures do I take to protect myself? Yeah, so as soon as I could work full time off just biking and not do anything else, like it was still kind of a struggle to pay for life, but I made sure to get like insurance for stuff. So I do definitely have like all the travel insurance I need if I'm ever hurt. I do have extra insurance. So if I get injured, I pay about $70 a month and that covers me for like a certain amount of my revenue if I were to get injured. And luckily in Canada, the sort of insurance is really cheap where I live. So it's, it's not too bad, but I have multiple. It probably ends up costing me quite a bit of money every month in total, but it definitely protects myself. And another thing too, is like when you are working for yourself as a sole proprietor, I try to save 30% of what I make and put it into savings. So I'm always building up my revenue and I'm always like in a good place and I'm not feeling like I'm dependent on a sponsor hundred percent of the time. Okay. Next thing. Um, <laughs> how would you figure out how many people bought continental tires through me? This is really hard to know. It's really hard to say. Um, I think just showing like your influence in general. So 
if you're a racer who's gotten really good results, show that. And then if you've had some viral social media stuff, show that, especially if like the powerful, like it was awesome about Instagram is it's a free app and it has powerful analytics. You can like literally go to an Instagram story and show how many people clicked on at Continental Tires after you mentioned them in a story. And if it was like 20 people, then you can show that to the brand and you can basically show like how your influence is working. And you can, if you can save all that data and bring it into one place, then you can present that in, in a clean form in as clean of a form as possible. That's going to really help you out. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, 14 and a mountain biker. Be cool to get to know some of you meet up. Oh, awesome. So it's cool to see you guys are already connecting as well. Like definitely show your social media channels in here. I think that's a big part of this too, is like that community building, that connection. One really cool thing you can do, like all you guys can do right now to help each other is you could post about how you were in this workshop and tag each other in each other's stories or feed posts and share each other's content. And like whenever I see like a friend of mine who's doing something really cool, I'll share a post, their post in one of my stories and I'll, I'll support them. Like it's all about supporting each other. It's a small industry and it's really cool when people can support each other and help each other out and help each other build each other's followings. So that's a big part of it is that community building aspect of the sport, which is what I love about mountain biking is it's such a friendly sport and everyone's always there to help each other out. Okay, one other thing, if you live in Worcester and you ski in the winter and bike all summer, um, if you had a sponsor like Smith, yeah, like that's a really great example. Like Smith is already immersed into both those sports and living in Whistler, you've pretty much hit a gold mine because that is like the place to be for progression. So yes, Smith would be a great sponsor to have for that. Okay, so you've um, been offered to join a local team for enduro racing. The team has multiple companies on board and discounts on products. Yeah, I think that's a really great place to start. Like for myself, I personally would never join a team as a media athlete because it puts me in a vulnerable, vulnerable position. If my sponsorship with that team ended, then I would lose all my sponsors. But for someone like you who's starting out and you have this opportunity to get on a race team, like it's going to give you like, it's pretty much going to ensure you're going to have dial bikes all the time. It's going to eliminate a ton of your worries and it's going to allow you to focus more on your riding and you're not at the point where you're getting paid anyways. So this is a really great option and it's really great because you'd be surprised how quickly employees of bike companies bounce from one brand to another. So being on a team, connecting to those people on a team, staying loyal to them, is going to help you in the long run good because who knows like five years down the road from now the person who was running that race team might be working for your favorite bike sponsor and then all of a sudden they know you and they're they're stoked on what you're doing and then you've signed with them so it's always great to have an open mind and take any support you can get starting out so you're only 12 years old um and you get great results what should i write in a sponsorship email like Definitely being such a young age, like I would say if you can get someone to help you out with that as well, like it's going to be really hard for a brand to take a 12 year old kid seriously in an email, like no matter how good you are at what you do, like it's just like it's because of your age, unfortunately, it's going to be really tough. So if you can like take this knowledge from my workshop or show it to your parents and get them to help you with the resume and keep it nice and short and concise, I think that's going to be what really helps you out. Okay, um, when doing Instagram posts, should I try using more hashtags to grow? Um, I mean, one thing I do is because I don't like the look of like 30 hashtags in a post is add the hashtags in the comments because luckily with Instagram, if you hashtag in your own comments, you will, it won't be as visible because other people's comments will bury it and it will still get shared all over the platform. Whereas like something like TikTok, you can't do that. So one great thing about Instagram is yes, definitely use hashtags. It will help a little bit. But don't be so worried about these little strategies like hashtags and being discovered on the app. It's more about like content is everything, consistency and always putting stuff out there. Um, okay, so, so how important do you think the story is with an athlete like Emil um, who has an autoimmune versus Eric Fedico who seems to just work hard? Yeah, well, I think that's been really inspiring about Emil. Like his story is definitely really cool. And Red Bull has definitely taken that story and turned it into something even bigger for like just promotional purposes. It catches people's eyes. It's really interesting. Whereas Eric Fedko might not be as interesting in people's eyes because he just works hard and kills it on a bike. But both these dudes are like amazing athletes. And 
I think guys like Eric would be even more successful if he put more energy into like creating content for his audience rather than showing off his skills and his, and for example, like when he couldn't get into Crankworks Rotorua this year because of COVID-19 because he's Italian and he got stuck at customs and he kind of made a big stink about it and he didn't, he didn't really promote himself well. And he made a lot of sponsors and other brands angry at him for like not carrying himself well through that situation. I think that is huge. Like no matter how talented of an athlete you are and how good you are, like you have to be really careful about that. And I think like Emil on the other hand has been really careful about that. And he's talked about his own struggles, but he's done it in a really tasteful way. So both amazing dudes, both great guys, but I think the way they talk about their story is I think it makes Emil a little more of a likable personality and that's huge. And I think that's important. The more likable your personality is, the better it'll be for you. Um, did I spend a lot of money to sponsor content at the beginning of my career? What kind of strategy? Yeah, well, it's hard. Like I got really lucky growing up in BC because there's so much good riding around here that I didn't have to spend a lot of money traveling or going places. In addition to that, I had friends who are really talented filmmakers that I, were kind of at my disposal and I could hang out with them and shoot with them. And that really helped me. So I think having that available rather than spending money, like don't worry about spending your money at the start buy what you need to buy to get yourself rolling on your bikes. But think about like pay for things in your time. So if you can find someone to shoot with and edit videos with and go practice with, like that's where all your energy should be going. How do you decide which personal information is valuable to share? I think you almost have to reverse engineer it. So imagine that you're a company reading your own resume and think about what is the most valuable thing. Like if you talk about, you love riding your bike because you've been doing it with your dad since you were five years old. Like if I'm a company, if I'm a company, I don't really care about that. Like as awesome as that is, and you come from a really rad family, like that sentence is just a waste of space in your resume. So get rid of it and just focus on what you can do to provide value to that company. And you can like, you can show your passion in other ways. I feel like, like if you can like just show examples of the content you've done and how you're very passionate about what you do and have I like a little blurb about yourself, but don't go too into detail. I think a lot of people made that mistake when I was looking at um, everyone's resumes so far was they spent like a couple paragraphs talking about themselves and their story. And that's great and everything. And it's really nice to hear, but you want to really shorten that and be more concise with brands. Um, how do you gain confidence to do a lot of tricks? A lot of that comes down to like just time and patience and repetition you want to always be pushing yourself to a level where you're a little bit scared, but not like too scared to do it. So find out what that threshold is for you and always push yourself to that level. And you'll, you'll slowly progress more and more and more. And you'll just get to the level where those really big, scary tricks will always be kind of scary, but you'll know that you can do them. So you'll be able to pull them off. Okay. So a few repeated questions, but I'm going to answer five more questions and I'm going to sign off because it's almost quarter after one already. So I've gone quite a ways over time. Let's see here. So um, what would you do in this situation? I've been in New Zealand for two years. I'm from India, living in Queenstown. That's cool. Queenstown's like such a sweet place. I've been there twice. Um, okay. But starting from the bottom, start coaching. Cool, man. So you're trying to figure out how to be appealing if you don't know where to start. Um, especially, yeah, because there is everyone here is very massively talented, that's true. So I'd say for like Queenstown, like um rather than worrying about the competition around you, because there's a ton of it, think about like all the strengths you have living there. So like you are living in a place with some of the best mountain biking in the world, some of the best riders in the world. Think about how you can collaborate with those other riders versus compete with them. If it's someone you're trying to race against, like ride with them and ride together. Cause like, I don't know what the culture is like. Like I know it's really good in New Zealand, but a lot of people that race against each other love to ride with each other because they equally help each other get faster and it keeps that vibe going. So, I mean, take people that are better than you and spend as much time as you can riding with them until you're better than them or you're getting close to their level. And also use that opportunity to create content of yourselves riding together because that's going to be really exciting for your viewers. And I think just thinking about like, almost make a list of like all the great things about living in Queenstown and how they can benefit me as an athlete and then go out and execute those things. Okay. One more question from Sam. Is there anything you can add? Oh, can I add your preset to my GoPro footage? 
Oh, so for fun, you want to know if it's good for Final Cut Pro? I'm not quite sure it's specifically for Adobe Premiere Pro, but I'm thinking what I might do soon is I'll do a tutorial on how to color grade on Adobe Premiere from scratch if my preset can't be applied because I know Premiere and um, Final Cut Pro are very similar programs. So if you see what I do on Premiere Pro, it might help you try to like repeat the same thing on Final Cut. Should we promote companies even when they don't know? I would say this is a good idea if you're brand new, you're just starting out and you're already doing great stuff. Like if you truly believe like what you're doing is good and you're putting out nice content, then absolutely like take companies, say what you love about their stuff. And then you can share that with them after a few months has gone by and you have a nice portfolio of content. Be like, hey, I'm already promoting you. Like I'm starting to figure this out and I would love to just start something a little more formal even at a grassroots level. And then like, hopefully they're open to that because as a brand, like there's, so many grassroots athletes that just don't deliver for them. So if you can deliver for them before they're even asking anything of you, that would give them more than enough reasons to help you out a little bit. Okay. Um, what else we got here? Yes. Yeah, so Lauren's asking if I edit my own program. I use my own content. I use um, Adobe as well. I have Premiere Pro, Lightroom, and those are like the two I use the most. Okay, so there's quite a few kind of similar questions here. I'm already at almost 20 after one, so I unfortunately have to go here. But if you guys want, like, there's some really great questions here. So when I have the time for it, I'm gonna answer as many of these as I can. If I missed your question, please, please go into the folder itself. And just like go underneath, let's say the little announcement I have, or what you can do, you can comment under the entire folder. So if you, if you go look at the folder over here and you look at the top right, there's already 106 comments under become a sponsored athlete folder. But if you can go in there, write more questions to me, I'll spend my time later tonight getting back to them as soon as I can. So thanks so much, everyone. That's it for the workshop. I really had a lot of fun helping you out. And feel free to message me again here on Bubble Up on Instagram and my direct messages. I try to answer those as much as I can. Even feel free to email me. I honestly might get back to those sooner. So you can get access to my email from my Instagram account. You can also just email mark at markingmath.com and I'll try to get back to your answers as soon as I can. And I'd love to hear more recommendations on folder content here. So yeah, that's, that's it guys. Thanks again so much. And hopefully I'll do another one of these again really soon. I'd love to do one on how to create a resume using a bubble up role because I think I can help you guys make really simple resumes that are going to look really great. And I can run you through that in a workshop and it's going to be really valuable for you. So yeah. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Cheers. Peace. Thanks, Mark. Thanks.